Welcome to the High Pressure Podcast with me, George Rotterman. And me, Marie Williams. Brought to you by Reliably Rotterman. Bringing you industry news and trends. Plus, insightful conversations with industry leaders. Let's get to today's show. So I'm so excited today to have Chris Finn from FIBA Technologies. We're going to have some great discussions, as well as we have Jim Henley, their engineer, online with us today. So we are going to get started and talk about vaporization. Now, when you say that, sometimes at a cocktail party, the people might say, what on earth are you guys thinking about doing? But we are talking about some fun stuff with cryogenics. So could you, Chris, real quickly, and Jim, tell us the basic vaporization. What is vaporization and what are the basic ways to vaporize? So we, we, today we have, uh, you know, multiple different products. Our, our core product is obviously our ambient vaporizers, obviously, which, which use the ambient temperature outside to take cryogenic liquids to, um, usable gaseous, um, uh, product. Uh, we also do, um, and Jim can speak more technically on it when, when we do switch to powered vaporizers. Um, usually in a powered application, it's, uh, the ambient air obviously isn't uh you know warm enough to to get the uh, the liquid ga- liquid product to a gaseous form so we do uh jim electric vaporizers water bath vaporizers jim why would somebody use a ambient versus electric versus a, a water vaporizer well it all depends on uh, what heat source you have right so you want to have it as cheap as possible to vaporize the cryogenic liquid and uh the ambient vaporizers you obviously use air so air is pretty cheap uh, as long as you have the real estate to put the ambient vaporizers in, that's usually your best bet. Um, other options are electric vaporizers or steam, direct steam vaporizers or just circulating water. Um, if you have a water loop in a plant, you can take advantage of that. So you, you just use the energy from the circulating water loop, cooling loop. Or if you have a steam in the plant, you can use you know any excess steam or just in the steam loop. Or electric, if you don't have Room for ambient vaporizers and you want a more compact solution than, uh, and you have, you know, 40 volt electricity, then you probably want to go with an electric vaporizer. So it really depends on what heat source you have and, you know, how you're going to use them. Yeah. So when somebody's looking at an installation, part of a, a big piece that you're right is the footprint, right? What, what amount of space do they have to work with? What would be the spacing you need to have between the vaporizers? So. When you were, if you were out in the field and somebody said, okay, we're looking to do an installation, what would be the first three or four questions you would ask? Well, first, if they want to use ambient vaporizers, which is usually the best solution. And then do they have, as you mentioned, it requires some footprints. So do they have enough space for the ambient vaporizers? And then the other questions would be, uh, how much fluid are they vaporizing? You know, the flow rate, how often, uh, the location, since uh, you're depending on these ambient vaporizers to defrost. You want the uh, the weather patterns of the location to give it enough time to defrost. If it's a if it's a location where there's a long winter, you need a lot more vaporization because you need some vaporizers to get through the winter because it's not going to defrost during that time. And so you have flow rate, the location, and pressures. Especially if you're using it for CO two, the pressure is dependent on. You know the boiling point is dependent on the pressure, so. You need to know the, the uh, pressures of the, of the CO2. Let's pretend like I just came into the industry and I don't even know what a vaporizer is used for. Why would I be interested in buying a vaporizer? What, would, what does that do for me? Well, I think it's, I mean, mo- most of the applications uh, in our industry that, you know, obviously most of the molecule is mo- moved as a cryogenic gas because um, you can move more volume that way, but it's used as a gaseous molecule. So um, most applications, of, you know, majority of the applications, whether it's a hospital install or what, you know, they're, they're, they're trucking in liquid oxygen, um, but obviously you're breathing in gaseous oxygen. So um, the, key, the key aspect is to get it from a, a transportable, you know, liquid form to a, a usable gaseous form. Um, and obviously the ambience as Jim alluded to, are, uh, you know, low maintenance, but, you know, you have to have the footprint X, Y, Z. Um, if you don't have that, usually that's more uh, when you switch to a power vaporizer. But again, it's 
all getting the, 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 the molecule from how it's transported to, uh, uh, you know, how it's typically used, which is in gaseous form. So, yeah. Uh, and these fluids, you know, if it's a large application, if you're using a lot of it, that's when it's transported by uh, liquid, liquid nitrogen oxygen. If it's just a smaller application, you can buy it as a gaseous form, you know, in cylinders or something like that. But the large applications you want it to, you usually have to transfer it in the liquid form. So that's why we use vaporizers. Makes sense. And they're storing it in liquid form and just trying to get it, like you're saying, Chris, from that big bulk tank outside of a hospital and then to the user that's going to be using it as a gas. So they need to do that quickly. And by, do, by having the vaporizer in between the two, it warms it up, becomes a gas, and then the end user gets to use it. So when you size a vaporizer for volume, you're going to look at the, how much flow we need to have and at what pressure. And then what zone you're in, what temperature zone in. And that's what, how we do the sizing. Is, is there something I'm missing there? And then also how long you flow it for. If you're going to use it, oh. you know, eight hours, you know, every four weeks versus continuous, it makes a big difference on the sizing. That's a great point. How is the customer using the gas? Is it a laser running for eight hours? And then there's the X amount of, X amount of time, 16 hours not operating. Or is he running 24 hours a day? What, what, what amount of time does it have to have vaporizer to warm back up? and be prepared for the next cycle. So would I need a larger vaporizer or a smaller vaporizer if I was not using, if I was only using it, you know, if I was using it inconsistently? Well, well, you gotta, you gotta figure most of the sizing of the vaporizers that we have, you know, all of our models are, you know, DPC-20K, 30K, and, that, and that's, that's referencing the flow, but that's also assuming like an eight hour duty cycle at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So um, when you, when you increase, say, to 24 hours, especially with an ambient vaporizers, as Jim was alluding to, is you don't give the, the vaporizer a chance to defrost. So as you see a lot of these vaporizers running, and when they're in, in, in cycle, you'll, you'll see the ice loads build up. And that's because, you know, you know typically, as they run more time, you're going to have that, the, the vaporizers freeze up, and then as a result, not be as effective operating. So, you know, we could, we could have a a 10,000 foot flow running 24, 24, seven and be sizing a vaporizer at a hundred K mm, wow. uh, just to keep up with that type of demand. Yeah. So, so duty is very important, obviously, because these vaporizers, they're not, a, the ambient vaporizers aren't powered and they do need time to recover, defrost, to, to, to operate as they're designed. So it re really, like I said, the sizes are based off of uh, an ambient temperature of 70 degrees and eight hour cycle. So you go to Maine or uh, Canada or XYZ, you, you know, you go to Jim when he does the sizing is, is sizing it based off the coldest uh, temperatures, which could be minus 20, minus 40 degrees. And therefore, if they're a 10,000 foot flow, they, you know, they might really need something four or five times larger to keep up with the temperature. So so what would happen if you had the incorrectly sized vaporizer, it did not have enough capacity, what would be the experience the customer would probably have? Uh, they would, you know, you would start pulling liquid through the, the vapor. Um, it wouldn't, the, you know, wouldn't properly uh, vaporize. Yeah, eventually your, your outlet temperature would start dropping. It could be completely frozen so that no air can pass through the fins. And like Chris mentioned, eventually you could get liquid breakthrough. Okay, so we talked about some of the common pain points and some of the areas relative to the vaporization and then spacing and how the downdraft, we got to get heat to come down, right? And cold air to go out. So we have to have the right spacing and right location so that airflow can come through. Right. We, we usually like to space them at least three feet. We recommend usually about six feet apart. And okay. another problem would be if you get the, the, them enclosed in a, in an area with, you know, surrounded by walls where there is no escape for the cold air. So you want to avoid that with the ambient vapor. I just want the, uh, yeah. the cold air to disperse out. Can you size a vapor vaporizer too big or is this a product that you can grow into? It really can't be too big. Um, it, you know, the problem is when it's too small. Right. Uh, if it's too big, you'll just get a large, a closer approach. The, the outlet temperature will be warmer, closer to the ambient temperature. And that's generally not a problem, you know, except, of course, the larger ones cost more and you, you want to avoid, you know, paying more than what you, what you need. Is there anything from your perspective that may be an oversight customers have when thinking about vaporizers or um, deciding it's time to get a vaporizer? I don't know. Is there, is there any, any common um, 
like, oh, I wish customers understood this or thought of this when choosing a vaporizer? Well, I think the biggest thing is, um, is, is sizing the vaporizers to get through a freeze period. They, they see they have a flow rate, you know, they use it so often or even continuous, but then they don't take into account during the winter that that vaporizer will not have a chance to thaw so that they need enough vaporization to get through that period when it's below 32 and the vaporizer won't thaw. And a, a lot of times that kind of shocks people how, how, uh, big the vaporizers get in, in those situations. Yeah, I think it's important from a sizing standpoint too that the customers have confidence in the sizing capabilities. Because you know we 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 run into situations where you know other vaporizer manufacturers are sizing things you know much smaller and they're not taking into account that freeze period that Jim's discussing there. Right? You know, I think it's um and then at, at the same time customers should be realistic if you know you know, if they only have one or two days a year that has these deep freeze periods and they can, you know, they can function without having a vaporizer run on those days, you know, you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, avoid some of the costs and having to oversize it to compensate for those, you know, fractions of, a, of, of the year, you know. Um, but it is, it is important, um, especially with these, the ambient vaporizers to account for those colder periods, especially for, for companies that are running, you know, or have to run every day five days a week or seven days a week per se. You know, one of the areas that's been growing a lot for gas distributorship is the brewery and the cannabis, a whole bunch of markets that have CO2. What a great application that is for electric vaporization. So can I touch on that, get some of your feedback on electric vaporization and some of those other market opportunities? So Jim, Jim can talk more about the specific design. Uh, we, we came out with our electric vaporizer, Jim, about three years ago. Um, um, and the direct process vaporizers. Um, again, a lot of applications that we're, we're selling them today are, like you said, George, the cannabis and, and the brewery market where you don't have the large footprints and you don't have the like the spacious um, areas to put a stand-up vaporizer. So people are choosing to go to um, the electric version, which is more compact design. Specifically, what we're selling most into is a CO2. Uh, product market, but we're also doing some fill plants as well where there's limited space. And then Jim, like, like I said, Jim's got experience previously with design and electrics, and, and, and I think he took um, our design and, and improved it uh, in the market. And Jim, you can maybe specifically talk about our electric vaporizers that we're offering today. Yeah, so our electric uh, product line, uh, it's called the Finstack Electric Vaporizers. We call it Finstack because we Stack up um, aluminum uh, heaters that are, are cast, aluminum plates in between plates that hold a stainless steel tubing where the cryogen will flow and get vaporized. And uh, like our standard model will be a 12 kilowatt. And then you can just add additional plates and heaters to expand to make it a, a larger capacity vaporized. The one true downside is when you get into power, now you got mechanical items to maintain, maintain specifically the heating element. Um, and, you know, we've, in, in Ohio plant, we've rehabbed a lot of the, you know, you know, electric vaporizers have been in service for 10 plus years and the heating elements have burned out or need, need to be replaced. Uh, I think to just allude a little bit of Jim was talking about how we, how we assemble them. Jim came up with a nice design that allowed it to easily uh, unpack and repack back together. So if a heating helmet does burn out, they're easily, you know, replaceable per se. Um, and we, you know, on the FIBA side, we, we do maintain and rehab a lot of those for some of the majors that are, are you know, taking them out of service and want them revamped. I think one of the things our customers will appreciate is at, uh, at that point that the heating element needs to be replaced or if it got damaged, uh, our design makes it very uh, easily, easily done. So I think that's a, a nice part of the design that we came out with. You know, we, our, our frames are fully aluminum and stainless. We're not using any carbon steel, uh, where some of the other, you know, manufacturers, you know, save on cost and use painted carbon steel. And again, that's just a long-term maintenance item. So yeah, I mean, it's one benefit of our, our design that we, we we're currently offering. That's a great point. So if you have to maintain and repair it, it's not, Difficult to get to the element that you have to fix or change or the 
electronics. Yeah, I mean, like I said about earlier about the ambience, it's those are set it and forget it, you know. But with when you introduce a powered element, you're gonna have maintenance. Again, you're gonna have you're gonna have heating elements as you as you know in any heating elements, they're not gonna last, you know, much more than ten years. So uh, there is there is maintenance to them, and that's where Jim Jim came up with a nice design to to make that ease easily. That's great. Nice job, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, George. Good for you. <laughs> It also has. Uh, I should mention that they have two. Di- we have two different standard controls for the the fin stack. One is the on off control, and then we also have a, a PLC control scheme that will turn on uh, stepwise one third of the heaters so that you can get better better temperature control at, at lower flows. Great. Thanks for watching. Stay up to date with the latest news in the gas and welding industry by clicking on the subscribe button. And check out one of our other videos to learn more. Find out more about Reliably Ratterman at rmiorder.com.